Good morning, church family. Today we are continuing our Summer in the Psalm series, and we will be in Psalm 145. Now, I always find it interesting when prepping for preaching on a psalm, because during the year when we're working our way through a book of the Bible like Matthew, when I'm on the schedule for preaching, the passage is also already scheduled. So I just take that passage, meditate on it, and see what the Lord has for us, for his people. But when we are here in the Psalms, the chapter is not scheduled. We get to pick which psalm we want, which some people like. But it'd be much easier if the Psalms only had five chapters to choose from. But we have 150 Psalms. How am I supposed to pick a Psalm? There's too many options, and every chapter truly is worth preaching on. We can learn, grow, and be challenged from every single chapter. So as I went through this process of picking a psalm, I would read various chapters while seeking the Lord to see what he had for us today. And I finally ended up on Psalm 145. And as I read through this chapter, here's why I thought this psalm was so important for us today. David writes this psalm as a song of praise, but much more than external expression It is a revelation, and for us today, a challenge of continual internal worship that then saturates our lives. We will see David praise God, but that praise goes far beyond his own external life. And my prayer today is that we will leave here praising God and worshiping God, and that our worship of him will saturate our lives and the lives of those around us. Let's read the passage before we jump in today. Psalms 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling. And raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. What an encouraging passage. Now, one of the things that we miss because we aren't reading the passage in the original Hebrew is that this passage is an alphabetic acrostic poem, meaning each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We've seen other psalms written this way. This is the eighth and final acrostic poem in the psalms, five of them being written by David. Now, if you look at the top of the passage, the top of the chapter, it says, a song of praise of David. Now, if you look through the psalms, you'll see these titles over most of the chapters, some of them added by the writer, some added after. You'll see titles as short as of David or of Solomon, that note who wrote them. Others are labeled a psalm. Others have contextual information on what was going on when the psalm was written. 
There's a number of them that say to the choir master, meaning they're meant to be sung. Others even have instruments labeled. Others are labeled as songs of ascent, which were songs sung during specific times. So this psalm is labeled a song of praise of David. So David was the one who wrote this psalm, and while some Psalter titles were added after they were written, it seems to make sense that David wrote this title himself, driving the focus of this psalm as a true song of praise. An interesting thing about Psalm 145 is that this is the only psalm actually labeled in the Psalter specifically as a song of praise. We have many labeled as songs and many labeled as praise, but none other labeled song of praise. So that's clearly the focus of the passage for us today, the praise of God. Now within this chapter, we have six different sections, all focused on praise, but with different focus points. So section one is verses one through three. He is praiseworthy. Section two is verses four through seven. His works are praiseworthy. Section three, verses eight through nine. His attributes are praiseworthy. Section four, four, verses 10 through 13. His kingdom is praiseworthy. Section five, verses 14 through 20. His mercies are praiseworthy. And section 6 is verse 21. He again is praiseworthy. Let's jump into the text. Section 1, verses 1 through 3, he is praiseworthy. Verse 1, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will extol you, my God and King. So the word here, extol, is the idea to raise up, to lift up, to exalt, to give stature to, and to honor. Extol is a form of praise, usually with enthusiasm. There is intentionality here, and responsibility, and humility. Look at the personal pronouns that David uses. He says, I will extol you, my God and king. David isn't just honoring a God or a king. He's saying, you are my God, and you are my king. There is authority being recognized here and David's submission to it. There is honor, prestige, and glory being attributed here. David is extolling or raising up and exalting the being that is the supreme creator and also the reigning king. David is putting God where he belongs, above all else. I think the intentionality in his words reveals David's internal heart posture before God. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Now, bless your name. Bless, this word is used over a hundred times in the Psalms. And bless means different things depending on the relationship. But when mankind blesses God, here's what that means. It means to speak words of excellence about. So that could be to ascribe to God characteristics that are his, to acknowledge his sovereignty, and to express gratitude for his mercies, and so forth. So David here doesn't take that lightly. He says, bless your name forever and ever. He's clearly thinking long term. This is the desire of David's heart, which we see here is to continually and always speak words of excellence about the name of God. Now, here's the issue. In order to speak words of excellence about God, we need to know God well enough to do so. We are incapable, I don't know if this is just humans, but we are incapable of speaking words of excellence about someone we know nothing about. David knew God. David loved God. David is referred to in Acts 13, 22 as a man after God's own heart. So David pens this psalm, stemming from a vibrant relationship with God, an experience of God, and being rooted in worship of God, extols, praises, and blesses God here. He continues the thought in verse 2. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Now we have both long-term, forever and ever, and short-term every day. Every day is a consistent, regular orientation of the mind to worship. 
acknowledging who God, who God is, what he has done, and orienting our lives to it. It takes intentionality and discipline to extol and bless God, whether that's long-term or short-term. And we will not intentionally extol, bless, or praise God when our priorities aren't in check. When we are distracted, how well do we praise God? When we are too busy, how well do we praise God? When we are living in unrepentant sin, how well do we praise God? True external praise of God comes from genuine internal worship. Verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Great is the Lord. This is a statement of praise, but also a statement of recognition. God is greater, mightier, higher than any, exceedingly more than we can comprehend. That is fact. But in addition to that, he is greatly to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. There is no one else, no other being, no other creation who is great like him, and nothing else is worthy to be praised like he is. Now, beyond the fact of God being great and greatly to be praised, his greatness is unsearchable. Here's the idea. We know God is great, right? We could do better than that. We know God is great, right? Yes. Yes. But the more we study God's word, the more we see God's actions, the more we experience the goodness of God, the more we then understand how great God is, right? Oh, come on. You fell asleep that quick? God is great, right? Yes, that's a much better. Amen. Have you ever heard the phrase, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know? It's true. The more we learn about the greatness of God, the more we understand the acts of God, the more we experience the goodness of God, the more we understand how unsearchable his greatness is and how we will never truly understand how great he is. How great is that? Well, sometimes the unknowns don't feel great. We don't like unknowns because unknowns are generally unpredictable. This is where God is different. The unknowns of God are not unpredictable because God is unchanging. God does not change. This is called the immutability of God. We know that in the future, God will be faithful because God is faithful. We know that in the future, God will be great because God is great. So we can rest in the fact of the greatness of God, even though it's unsearchable, because we can be confident beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter how far we search, we will only ever find continual greatness in the character of God and can continue to walk in confidence that our God is a great God. Amen? Now look at this. In the first three verses, we have what I would call three different words that are parts of worship. We have extol in verse one, bless in verses one and two, and praise in verses two and three. There are some similarities and some differences. So extol, again, is the idea to raise up and to lift up, exalt, to give stature to and to honor. Extol is a form of praise, usually with enthusiasm. Bless is to speak words of excellence about. So ascribing to God characteristics that are his, acknowledging his sovereignty, and expressing gratitude for his mercies, and so forth. Praise is an expression of admiration, gratitude, and devotion. It's the idea of boasting for someone else. It's the act of glorifying God individually, but also corporately. All three of these words are parts of worship, but worship is much deeper than external praise. The Lexham Theological Word Book says this, Worship is the reverential response of creation 
to the all-encompassing magnificence of God. So through the Bible, we see worship encompassed in a variety of different ways. We see bringing forth an offering to God, bowing down in God's presence, by lifting up and exalting God with praise and wonder, by celebrating God, praising and singing, and by serving God. Devotion to the rituals in the Old Testament could be a visible sign of an inner attitude of reverence before God, or evidence of a whole life given to God. But we know, especially as we've been in the book of Matthew, and we've seen the lives of the Pharisees, that external obedience is not proof of right motivations. But external obedience can be a fruit of a right heart before God. So here's what I believe is going on here in Psalm 145. David's external praise that we see here is the overflow of David's consistent worship of God. Let me repeat that again. The praise that we see here in Psalms 145 is external praise coming from an overflow of David's consistent walk with God, which grows from David's consistent walk with God. David knows God. He experiences God. And he loves God. This psalm is evidence of that. So coming out of these first three verses, we see the heart of David on display. He lives a life of worship, resulting in him consistently extolling, blessing, and praising God. So into the next section, verses 4 through 7, we see the impact of knowing God and worshiping God. When we as believers know God and know the works of God, we know this. His works are praiseworthy. Verses 4 through 7. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. So here's what I see here. We repeat what we think is praiseworthy, and they repeat what they're taught. I'm pointing to the next generation here. Verses 4 through 7 shows the weight placed on us to pass the knowledge of God to the next generation. Who needs to tell of the works of God? We do. Who needs to declare of the mighty acts of God? We do. Who needs to talk about the glorious splendor of his majesty? We do. And if we don't, they won't. But when we do, they will. And when we do, then they will speak of the might of his awesome deeds while we continue to declare his greatness. And when we do, then they will pour forth the fame of his abundant goodness and shall sing of his righteousness. But if we don't, they won't. John Piper said this, It is the biblical duty of every generation of Christians to see to it that the next generation hears about the mighty acts of God. God does not drop a new Bible from heaven on every generation. He intends that the older generation will teach the newer generation to read and think and trust and obey and rejoice. It's true that God draws near personally to every new generation of believers, but he does so through biblical truth that they learn from the preceding generations. Now, I don't want to skip over verse 5. Verse 5 again says this, On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Meditate. What does that word mean? To meditate is the idea of focusing your thoughts in quiet reflection, contemplation, and prayerful focus on God, Scripture, other spiritual themes, with the goal of growing closer to God and seeking insight from him. Meditation can also include repetition and memorization of scripture. Donald Whitney said this, through reading God's word, we receive the indispensable truth of scripture, but through meditation, we experience the truth of scripture. And he continued and said this, 
Meditation is the absorption of, of Scripture. By meditating on God and his word, it puts our minds on him. And where our mind and heart is, that's what we'll talk about. So if we want to talk about him and declare his greatness to the next generation, it starts with our hearts and our minds being set on him and him alone. Then we don't need to imagine what kind of impact our spiritual walk will have on the next generation. This is the impact that our spiritual walk will have on the next generation. And it is not a burden to declare the greatness of God. It is a privilege. Redemption, freedom, mercy, and grace. This is what the gospel offers. We see it every time we do baptisms and their testimonies, the incredible things that God has done. So church, people of God, take your testimony, the work of God in your life, and tell the world the great things he has done. And then don't just stop there. Tell of the great things that he has done through history and why the gospel is good news. Let us be a generation that praises his works because his works are praiseworthy. Section 3, verses 8 through 9, his attributes are praiseworthy. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Now, this is a good list of attributes that, are, that is worthy of praise. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, good to all. This is who he is, and we have experienced him. Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace that we have been saved. If God were not a gracious God, we would have no salvation. Is that worthy of praise? Romans 3.24 says we have been justified by his grace as a gift. Justification is a gift of God because of his grace. Is that worthy of praise? Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities and I'll remember their sins no more. Are sins remembered no more? Is that not worthy of praise? 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Is that not worthy of praise? 1 Peter 2.10, for, for you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You have, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We were not God's people, but now God's people because of mercy. Is that not worthy of praise? God is slow to anger. That is a quality that we like in people and that we are called to be. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Life is easier for us when we're slow to anger, right? Well, look at the Old Testament. God continually redeemed and rescued Israel. And how quick would they turn away? Praise God that he is slow to anger because how quick and how often do we turn away from God? We serve an incredible God who is so gracious, merciful, loving, and good. Amen? His attributes are praiseworthy. Section 4, verses 10 through 13. His kingdom is praiseworthy. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. So now God is not only just creator, but also the reigning supreme king. 
That's what this section is focused on, the kingdom of God. He is in control. He is in authority. So with God as our king and we as citizens of his kingdom, we have the responsibility and the privilege of blessing God, giving things to God, telling his power, and making known to the world his mighty deeds and his glorious splendor. This is a privilege, but this is also a responsibility. Do we take this seriously? Here's the thing. We can be confident in boasting about our king because his kingdom will never fail. It will never end. It is eternal, everlasting, and his dominion continues forever and ever. Now, that would be cause for fear if our God was not good or if he was not merciful. And maybe that's why this next section is focused on the mercies of God. But before we move into that section, just a note on verse 13b and why it's in parentheses. So if you see the second half of verse 13, it's in parentheses. Verse 13b provides us with the Hebrew letter N in the acrostic. Part of this verse is missing in some manuscripts and discovered later in other historical manuscripts, which is why it's in parentheses. But we are citizens of a kingdom that is everlasting, with a king whose dominion will never end. That is praiseworthy. Section 5, verses 14 through 20. The Lord upholds all who, are, all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open, their, your, you open your hand, you satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Now, as we read and meditate on this incredible description of the mercies of God... David and his hearers were no doubt noting how different Yahweh is from the idols of the nations. The idols and false gods were often angry, demanding, unmerciful, and unloving. But God. God is not singularly a reigning and sovereign king, but also a gracious and merciful king. As a sovereign king, he rules creation. But as a gracious and merciful king, he cares for his people. He helps the weak, the worn, and the tired. Verse 14. He feeds them. Verse 15. He opens his hand to satisfy the desires of his people. Verse 16. He is kind. Verse 17. He is near to those who call on him. Verse 18. He hears our cries and saves us. The book Exalting Jesus in the Psalm says this. Because God is sovereign, he is able to carry your burden. Because he is gracious, he's willing to carry your burden. Give it to him. These verses emphasize the personal relationship that David had with God and that we can have too. God is a personal, merciful, present God who cares for his people. But this is all for his people. We see that contrast in verse 20, but all the wicked he will destroy. God is a merciful king and also a just king, a holy king and a righteous king. We never want to overlook these complementary attributes. Sometimes we can swing the pendulum so far that we only talk about the wrath and holiness of God and we neglect the love, mercy, and grace of God. And sometimes we swing it the other way where we are only about the love, mercy, and grace of God and neglect the wrath, justice, and righteousness of God. These attributes are not contradictory. They are complementary. Let us strive to a deeper understanding of who God truly is and not just who we want him to be. But God is a deeply relational God. His mercies are praiseworthy. Verse 21, the final section, section 6, he again is praiseworthy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh 
bless his holy name forever and ever. So David wraps up this psalm, coming back full circle to the beginning of the psalm, praise forever and ever. And this is really the only place where we can land after a psalm like this. God who is unsearchably great, God who is glorious, God who is gracious and merciful and good and a sovereign king and a merciful king who loves those and cares for those under his care. There is nowhere else to land except to be left in awe-filled worship. When we know about the greatness of God, when we understand the acts of God, when we experience the goodness of God, and when we see the sovereign and merciful King, our response should be to extol, bless, and praise Him. Now, I want to take note of something that David says here as we wrap up. He says, My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. This is a commitment to bless and praise forever. Let this be the prayer of our hearts. Let us be committed as his people to extolling, blessing, praising, and worshiping God daily, intentionally, vocally, individually, and corporately. And as we are here in our corporate church gathering, Chris Benfield said this, Worship is displayed. The psalmist knew that there was an appointed place where the worship was offered and expected in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. That's us today. I'm certain that he had these moments of quiet reflection where he offered personal worship unto the Lord, but he was also aware of the need to offer his praise in a public display of corporate worship. There is something special about gathering with the people of God to worship the Lord together. We have dealt with this before, but I want to remind us of the need for corporate public worship. There is nothing wrong with private worship. In fact, we ought to possess an attitude of worship all the time. But there is nothing that will take the place of God's people coming together at an appointed time in an appointed place to worship the Lord together. That is an experience that I don't want to live without. I want to find my place among the people of God and worship corporately. Let that be the prayer of our hearts today. So as we close today and sing a couple final songs and take communion, take this opportunity to extol, bless, and praise, and worship God. And then take that into your week. Lift high the name of God to those around you and make his name known great. Let's pray. Lord God, you are worthy of all worship. And we worship you today echoing David's prayer here in the Psalms and David's worship through the Psalm. We are thankful that we can praise your name through our gathering, through studying your word, through singing songs. Lord, as we see through the Psalms, David had an incredible heart of praise. And we thank you for his example of how a deep walk with you resulted in a consistent life of praise and worship. Give us the eyes to see your kingship, your mercy, your greatness, and your presence and that it drives us to live a life of external praise that is rooted in a life of worship. You alone are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.